Thank you all for sticking around, and thanks to Zig for the invitation. Uh, really enjoyed uh, my stay here so far, learning about the Institute and the long history here of mathematical psychology. Uh, I think I'll skip that. Um, and I thank Yangshi for providing an introduction to um, Oh, I have to find my talk here. Uh, to wallpapers, uh, because they'll figure very prominently in the, uh, some of the empirical work that I'll uh, be describing to you. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, neural measurements and uh, a little bit of, very little bit about computation. Uh, and so this is work uh, done with my postdoc, Peter Kohler, and Alexandra Yakovlova in my lab, who's an applied mathematician, Yangshi, and our student, Chris. Uh, Alistair Clark, who's a computer scientist, who's now junior faculty at Essex, and my former postdoc, Benoit Cotero, who's now uh, in Toulouse at, uh, at the uh, CNRS Institute there. So, Carrying on with a theme, I think Yangshi in the back there introduced this notion of uh, regularity, and I'm going to talk about it first in the context of textures. Uh, so what are textures? They're spatially homogeneous patterns consisting of repeated elements, often subject to some randomization in their location, size, color, orientation. This is from uh, Portia and Simoncelli's definition. So we'll start from textures. and uh, we'll talk about textures and regularity space, and I think this is uh, something that Yangshi introduced, uh, the concept of regularity space that goes from very low regularity to complete regularity. So at the low regularity end, there are textures that people have called microtextures. Uh, this is Glarner et al. And these are very simple textures, and you can synthesize them if you just know their power spectrum. It's very simple, very simple statistically. Uh, there's another class of textures that uh, are called macro textures that are somewhat more complex. They have pairwise correlations between different spatial frequencies, orientations, and positions. So if you have a, a histogram of joint statistics, you can synthesize these more complex <laughs> textures, and this was uh, something that was uh, really popularized by uh, Portia and Simoncelli, more structured. And then finally we have the wallpapers, which are completely regular. So it's a nice space. We can go from low regularity to high regularity and uh, think about how this works in the brain. So how does the brain code these uh, textures? So here's uh, an inflated view of the brain. And one of the amazing things about the visual system is that it has many copies of the visual field, up to 20 or 30 copies of the visual field. So here are the first four of them. Uh, first visual area here in blue, V1, V2, V3, V4. So these are areas you can map in individual subjects. You can find them uh, using fMRI. And we know a lot about these areas from uh, work in animal models and, and from uh, fMRI studies. So what we know about texture is that V1 can code microtextures. It effectively can compute the power spectrum of an image and represent uh, the spectral properties of an image. Um, Jeremy Freeman, working with Aero Simoncelli, uh, exposed cortex V1 and V2 to these macro textures, these somewhat more complex textures. And interestingly, they found that V1 couldn't tell the difference between a macro texture and a comparable micro texture with the same power spectrum, but V2 could. So V2 is able to code this higher level of statistical regularity that's present in the macro texture that's not in the micro texture. And uh, so is area V4. So we have a sense of hierarchy starting to go here, and so what we'd like to ask, natural question, is what if you take regularity to 11 in the uh, final tap sense? 
Uh, not everybody I guess that reference, I guess. <laughs> but this is the most regular kind of pattern you could possibly make. Where do you start seeing this uh, ability to code the regularity in these perfectly regular textures? So it's an empirical question. Uh, so we'll look at this uh, using fMRI in, in uh, one section of the talk, and then once we've got some basic understanding of what uh, areas in the brain uh, are coding the symmetry in these wallpapers. We'll look at uh, which ones of them are most relevant for perception of symmetry. And finally, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the internal representation is structured uh, for, um, for the full group set of wallpaper patterns. Okay, so uh, we've seen this picture before. It's a really nice illustration from David Wade, who's an artist, He's written uh, several kind of small books. Uh, he lives in rural Wales and made this uh, for uh, his neighbor. And uh, so there's 17 of these groups, and they're compositions of different kinds of symmetry, rotation, reflection, glide re reflection, and uh, translations. And uh, they turn out to be very interesting uh, as experimental stimuli. And uh, I'll show you, show you how we uh, create them for experiments in a, in a second here. Uh, what I'm going to start with is uh, uh, a, the first experiment, the first sort of tractable experiment we did where we focused on a subset of the groups. These four, these are the ones that contain only uh, rotations. So P, the P2, P3, P4, P6. And um, so the question is, can we see anything in the brain that is related to the amount of re reflection symmetry in the images? So this has a highest order of rotation symmetry of six. There are 60 degree uh, angles between uh, the uh, tines in this, in this uh, pinwheel. This would be P4, highest order is four. So we're gonna be looking at brain responses parametric in the order of rotation symmetry. Uh, and so I'd like to show you how we, oops, let me, let me start that over again. Um, how we make our experimental stimuli. This is uh, based on uh, some stimuli that Alistair Clark had developed. And what you do is you start with uh, this fundamental region here and fill it with random noise. And we filter the random noise, uh, and then we can build any one of the wallpapers we want, starting from the proper fundamental region, the proper set of rules for each group, and, and the, uh, the, the lattice. Uh, so here's a fundamental region filling out the basic tile of a P6 group doesn't look like much. Uh, but then if we make a wallpaper out of it, then it starts looking better. Now, uh, what, what I think I could have done is I could have uh, used the proper centering of, of this tile on this and it would have been much more salient to you. But in a sense, I kind of wanted to not do that, just to kind of show you how arbitrary this translation factor is in making these wallpapers. So the nice thing about this is, uh, but just by starting with a new random noise inside the fundamental region, we can make um, many, many different uh, copies. So these are all new copies of a P6 wallpaper. And you would say there's, there's substantial perceptual similarity, but there's substantial diversity here. These are all the same wallpaper group. And so what we do is we tend to show multiple copies of a given group in an experiment so that we're not tied to a particular image for a given group. So we'll have multiple um, exemplars within a group when we do an experiment. 
Okay, so here, here are four examples, just uh, side by side. You can, you can see the basic uh, structure of multiple. And I think it's just remarkable that what you can get out in terms of an image from random noise with symmetry. This is like a remarkably structured, spectacularly beautiful pattern, I would say. Uh, but that's, the, that's one of the nice things about symmetry. Uh, so we want to have some control stimuli. So these uh, images all are highly structured. And there's, there's interesting structure, which is the structure of the group. And then there's what I'll call uninteresting structure, which is the structure of the power spectrum of the image. And so that would be the microtexture level structure the brain could respond to, have no, no idea about the higher level structure. So we want to have a contrasting image that we can show that's equivalent uh, to this in terms of low level features. The way we do that is we take the 2D Fourier transform of the image and we scramble the phases back transform into the space domain. And we get another pattern that has the same power spectrum. And interestingly, all groups, no matter what they are, if you do this, revert to a P1. Uh, and that, that's just because uh, of the lattice. The lattice has uh, spikes in the Fourier transform. And so you can't get rid of the spikes in the transform from, from uh, with the phase scrambling. So the spikes are still there, and that gives you the pure translation symmetry in, of P1 after phase scrambling. So this is a nice experimental control. So we can look at differences between intact and scrambled images. And so in, in an fMRI experiment, what we're interested in is, uh, is there a differential activation to the highly structured P2, P3, P4, P6 images compared to uh, mating uh, P1 images? So we'll look for a differential activation. So you get this P1 because the Fourier representation is spatially global. Yes. So, but if you did scrambling of the wavelet representation, then you probably could get rid of the P1. So if you do this spatially local wavelets uh, and then scramble them. Maybe. 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 Okay. I'm not sure. OK. I'm not sure. Uh, good question. So, so the way we do an experiment, is we would have, uh, fMRI is really slow, so we have to have uh, kind of a long period of time, because it takes two, three, four, five seconds for the bold signal to emerge. So we're gonna have a block of trials that will have the interesting test symmetry in it. And so th this will be an alternation between P1 and say P6, P1, P6, new P1, new P6, new P1, new P6, that'll go on for 12 seconds, and then we'll alternate that with a block which is P1, new P1, new P1, new P1, new P1. And so this would be a trial, so you have 12 seconds of these blocks. This would go on for four minutes for a given group. And every image that's updated is a new one. So we'll have many, many P6s in a P6 run with their mating P1 uh, controls. Okay, so then this is periodic. Uh, and so then we can uh, go into these regions of interest that we've defined with uh, mapping, retinotopic mapping. Let's say we look at, we're looking at V4, and we can look at the uh, power spectrum, actually the amplitude spectrum of the bold signal over this four minute. Uh, period, we happen to have 10 cycles of alternation between test and control. And so we see this nice spike here for P6 at 10 cycles per scan, exactly at the rate that we're alternating between intact and fully scrambled images. And for P2 down here, much smaller and uh, intermediate. So that's how we uh, quantify the, res the differential response to the presence of the structure in the, what we'll call the PX patterns, the ones that are not P1. And we can do a signal to noise ratio uh, metric just to quantify um, the amplitude. Uh, 
And as I said, there are lots of visual areas, many visual areas. We map a, about 12 of them or 11 of them in this experiment. So um, and nine of them are defined based on the fact that they are a spatial map of the visual field that we can actually measure using mapping techniques. And they go by clever labels like V1, V2, V3, and V4. Now, some of them have uh, more anatomically based uh, labels like interparietal sulcus area zero or ventral occipital area one. So we have these. These are all uh, hemifield maps of the, of the visual field. And then some of the areas we'll define on the basis of functional localizers. So area MT is defined on the basis of a motion localizer. Area LOC, actually a big uh, complex, is defined on the basis of a contrast between intact and scrambled objects. So then we can look in each of these areas to see if there's a parametric response to a degree of rotation symmetry. So let's start at the beginning, V1, V2, and V3, where we know the most about the representation of texture. Uh, and so here is SNR as a function of highest rotation order. If we look at V1, it's, it's perfectly flat. Uh, V2 maybe has a little bit of response. It's actually not significant. V3 very clearly, though, has a parametric uh, dependence on rotation order. So we, we thought this was pretty striking because you're already up to 11 uh, by the third visual area. It, was, it didn't take you until uh, very far into the visual system to code this very high-level structure maximum regularity already available to you uh, in the third visual area. Uh, we can look at some other areas. These uh, IPS0, MT, would be what are called dorsal stream areas. Uh, MT has uh, no response, no, no sensitivity uh, to rotation. Uh, these uh, two areas here, IPS0 and V3AB, have some small amount of sensitivity. It's, it's more like step-like as opposed to parametric. Uh, but uh, these, what would be called classic ventral stream areas, have very strong parametric dependence on rotation order. So we have at least four areas that are coding um, the order of rotation symmetry. And so if we go back to where we started with uh, this notion uh, that Jeremy Freeman introduces using these controlled stimuli to carve up the ventral stream, what, what's able to be extracted at this level, what's able to be extracted at this next level, we can add something to this uh, in which we, we, we can show that um, these three, these four areas here are sensitive to this high-level structure, these two areas aren't. And one of the things that was interesting about this is this is really the first uh, work that has found a job for V3. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's, it really is the first case where, where, where there's data that shows V3 does something that V2 can't. And it, if those of you who've seen depictions of the ventral stream based on the monkey, You'll always see the diagram goes V1, V2, V4, infrotemporal cortex. So it's a very canonical picture of the ventral stream. They always skip V3. So V3 uh, in human is actually a pretty important and interesting area and caution about generalizing too far from what we've learned from the monkey to human. Okay, so here we have again back to our micro, macro, and wallpaper textures, and, and there really is a sense of emerging hierarchy here, and quite early, uh, that, that you get uh, strong regularity responses very, uh, very early in, this, in the system. And we had some source-localized EEG data that uh, gives us the dynamics, 
so we can trace whether the system seems to be operating in a feed-forward fashion or feedback, and it looks to be accomplishing this in a feed-forward uh, fashion. So one of the other things we're interested in is if you have several areas that are responsive to symmetry, which ones do you use them all? If you're making a perceptual decision about symmetry, does, is there a, a lead area or not? So, so to do that, to a answer that question, we uh, need to measure brain activity and correlate it with uh, performance on a perceptual task. And so we're going to use a symmetry discrimination task uh, to do that. Uh, and again, we'll use the wallpaper patterns. And the subject's job is going to be to discriminate a P1 pattern uh, from either P2 on some trials, P3 on some trials, P4, or P6. So it's, it, is this not P1, you could say, is the, is the task. And it's a um, very simple task. It takes two seconds. A trial takes two seconds. The first second, you're looking at a P1 pattern on every trial. At one second, new images come up. It could be another P1, or it could be a Px, meaning it could be P2, P3, P4, P6. Your job is to push the left button if it's another P1, push the right button if it's a Px. Do that as quickly and as accurately as, as possible. And so then we can get percent correct, accuracy, reaction time, and, and uh, brain responses. So here we're going to use the EEG uh, to, to look at these responses, and, I'll, and it'll become clear in a, in a second why, why we want to do that. Uh, so high density EEG, uh, 128 channels. Uh, and then in, we're interested in relating this to the brain areas, much in the same way we did it with fMRI, but here it's a different problem. We have to do uh, what's called source imaging or source localization. Uh, and so what we do uh, is we make a, a very accurate geometric and electrical model of the head based on the individual participant's MR. So this is my MR image. Uh, it's my cortex. And so if we digitize the electrodes, we can uh, align them onto my anatomy. So that allows us to lock the electrical frame to the anatomical frame in a very precise fashion. And by uh, doing tissue segmentation, we can find my cortex, which is what generates the EEG, and use that as a constraint on where the sources could possibly be. Because it doesn't make sense to put sources in the gray matter, or in the white matter, which doesn't generate EEG, or in the ventricles. So this is a, an ill-posed inverse problem that we're going to be trying to solve. So we want to bring in as many reasonable constraints as possible. Another one is we constrain these elementary sources with schematized by green arrows to be orthogonal to the local surface normal. That's based on an underlying model of how EEG is generated in pyramidal cells. It's a pretty widely held view. So then here are the electrodes. So you can see the scales, the scalp, the skull, and the cortical surface. And then our job in source imaging is to uh, take the surface measurements here, which are schematized like a weather map, the potential, and to model uh, where, where the most probable uh, places in the brain are that this field came from. And so a variety of optimization techniques that, that we would use. And then we can then relate, because we have my cortex and my visual areas, we can say, how much current is in V4, how much current is in V1, and, and uh, look at the time course of the evoked response in P1 trials, Px trials, and relate that then to the perceptual decision. So there are two ways of doing these evoked potential experiments. One is that you average the data with respect to the onset of the stimulus. And there's a characteristic stimulus locked response, and that, that would be the sort of encoding, initial encoding of the stimulus. Then we can ask whether the evoked potential is, can tell you whether it was a symmetric or not symmetric pattern. Uh, 
or whether it was, in fact, a, a P1 versus a Px, because they're all symmetric. Uh, and the answer is yes, you can tell the difference between P1 and Px. If you look at voltage as a function of time, so 1,000 milliseconds is the time at which a new image comes on. If it can come on and be a Px, which is a cyan curve, or it can come on and be a P1, which is a magenta curve. So very clearly, there's a, a, a large difference in response uh, between the two. So Px has a bigger response than P1. And this, this will become important throughout the remainder of the talk. Uh, there are a couple of interesting other things on this graph. One is there's this time point here, which is about 90 milliseconds. That's when anything time locked to the stimulus happens in cortex. It's the initial response in cortex. Uh, then there's this other time period here. It's about 150 milliseconds when P1 and Px diverge. So this is how long it's about 60 milliseconds of processing, churning on this image before you can tell whether there's a uh, higher order structure in it. And then these are the reaction times. So the brain is telling the difference between symmetry P1 and Px and then 150 milliseconds. And you typically take 500 milliseconds to get the button down. So that's interesting. Uh, this is just a replication. Now we can now go into the cortex, into these different regions of interest. There are a bunch of them here. Uh, here's VO1. If you remember from before, this ventral occipital area was one of the most sensitive areas to rotation symmetry. And you remember B3 was very sensitive to rotation symmetry. And so these are areas with nice, highly significant responses. V3A uh, has a great <coughs> evoke potential, big responses, but it's, they're not differential. And the same would be true in, in uh, MT. So there are a number of the areas that we saw in the fMRI that are showing up as being sensitive to symmetry. But we're, we want to uh, go beyond can an area encode symmetry to the question of does the activity in that area predict what your reaction time is going to be? Because is it related to fluctuations in activity in that area? Are those related to fluctuations in your behavior? And the way we get at that is we use a response locked averaging. So we can now trigger the averaging to when you push the button. And then we look backwards in time from the button press to look at activity that's consistently related to the time the button goes down. And that will emphasize, emphasize uh, decision-related activity. So let's say here's a trial in green. There's the initial stimulus-locked activity. And then there's, let's say, the button press happened here. Another trial comes up. Could be the same group. It happens to have a faster reaction time. Now, if we align on the button press, we can emphasize the activity that was correlated with when the button went, went down and not correlated with the uh, time of the uh, stimulus locked activity, which will tend to be averaged out because you're now time locking on a different base. So that's, that's the logic. Um, here, here are some scalp maps uh, for Px here and P1 here. Uh, so this is way before, 400 milliseconds before the button goes down, not much going on. 200 milliseconds before the button goes down, there's a very clear uh, rise of activity uh, for Px, much bigger than P1. And then close to the button press, you see the activity shifted closer to motor cortex, away from occipital cortex, which is at the back. And, and there, uh, contralateralized. They're sort of mirror symmetric, uh, which is, has to do with the uh, handedness of the response to the two. So this is the sort of continuum from starting at, at the uh, visual areas and going to the motor decision areas. And we can then go back into cortex. And here again, uh, I'll just highlight for you these ventral occipital areas and V3 are, are again coming up as lead players uh, in 
their activity, fluctuations in their activity, will tell you or help you predict when the subject will push, push the button. So, last section of the talk, um, we were talking about the four rotation containing, exclusively rotation containing groups, but what about the rest of them? And uh, so we know there's a representation of order of rotation. Uh, David Wade has some idea about how these things relate to each other. He's ordered them P1, that's good, at the bottom. P6M at the top. P4M should be at the top, but it's kind of in the middle. Uh, the, it seems like these are things that have kind of triangular lattices. And I think there's, there's a sort of uh, artist's conception of what looks similar. And the field is kind of like that. Say, so, oh, well, you know, let's look at stimuli with reflections or rotations. But as Yangshi um, pointed out, uh, there's a well-known hierarchy uh, in this space, the hierarchy of subgroup relationships. And uh, this was laid out for us nicely uh, almost 40 years ago uh, by this table of subgroup relationships. I don't want to dwell on the details, so I'm going to go very quickly to diagrams of this. But, but the simple idea is you can think of this, or at least I think of this, as a, as a distance table. So here's P1 and here's P6M, 12. They're really that's a really big distance. Some of these are distances of two. Those are close. Some are far. Um, Yangshi uh, and uh, Robert uh, Collins uh, made a, a diagram of that so that it's much more interpretable visually. We can see these relationships diagrammatically. And the, uh, the tenant diagram that Yangshi showed as well uh, lays these out for us. And uh, so what we can do is we can use this as a prediction for the neural data. We can say, does the brain know anything about group theory? Well, we have a very, very specific uh, notion of what it is. And it's all of these subgroup relationships. So we have lots of ordinal relationships from the diagram. And we can ask, does the brain preserve them? So what we need uh, from the brain data is we need a distance me metric to compare so we can do orders on the, on the brain data. And we have a very simple uh, distance metric that I'll show you here in a second. The experiment is very similar to what we did in the, um, in the scanner. This is going to be an EEG experiment. So we're going to do P1, P6, P1, P6 in one block of trials, and we'll, but we'll do all 16 of, of the other groups. We don't get a shot at P1. We're wasting P1 as a, as a kind of baseline. Uh, so we'll have 16 groups, and uh, <clears throat> we'll look at the evoked response. So here's uh, data from a control block, P1, 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 P1. So Every time you update the contrast of an image, you get this sharp transient response. Here's another update. And they're basically equivalent because there's translational symmetry in the stimulus. It comes out as being translationally symmetric in the response. Uh, and this is actually a Fourier transform of the data. And taking advantage of symmetry relationships in the Fourier transform, translation symmetry in the time domain turns into even harmonics in the, in the power spectrum. So if we, if we go in with a, a stimulus cycle that takes 1,200 uh, milliseconds, the response, the basic periodicity here is, is uh, half of that or the second harmonic. So this waveform contains uh, second, fourth, sixth, eighth, 10th, 12th, all even order harmonics. And that's why the response is so symmetric. Now, if we look at the um, odd harmonics, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, uh, there's no response. 
in the control condition. That tells us that the response itself is perfectly symmetric. Every P1 update is equivalent. And what uh, becomes useful then is when we add in uh, the um, potential for an asymmetric response in that if you can code the presence of Px versus P1, you have a differential response. And that's reflected in the odd harmonics here. So very large, odd symmetric response. And these even harmonics are still there because there's still this kind of raw transient processing. So we toss those out because they're not diagnostic. Focus on the odd harmonics. And then what we can do is we just simply rank order them and calculate the RMS as our distance metric. That's how far they are from P1. So if you have a, if you really like P1, you're going to have a P1-like response and it's going to be symmetric. If you're not very like P1, you're going to have a very asymmetric response and that will come out in the odd harmonics. So this is symmetry in the frequency domain. Uh, anyhow, nice ordering. Uh, some giant responses, some familiar characters here, P6, P4, P4 is at the top of the food chain, P6 is at the top of the food chain. And then there are all these other ones. Okay, well, what we can do then is we can ask, does this ordering uh, map onto this order? So here we know what the subgroup relations are. We just asked, was... Uh, PMG bigger than PMM. And uh, uh, do I get this order right? And uh, check them off. There are 28 uh, orders here that we can tally. And uh, we get 23 of them. There are actually more. This doesn't have all of them. There are about 60 in the whole Coxeter scheme. Uh, we get about 53 of them. Correct. Just on ordering the uh, amplitudes. So, ending on that, uh, it's clear that symmetry is robustly represented early and often in the cortex, and that it, the representation of the groups looks to be compositional over subgroups. Uh, the idea being that subgroups uh, com uh, have, you can compose a, one group from a combinations of others and there's a nice hierarchy in the, in the diagram and that, that subgroup relationship looks to be preserved and it's almost like a linear summation of the more you have, the bigger the signal. And with that, I'll end and thank you for your attention. So, you said you have 23 out of 28, 53 out of 60. What do you mean by you got? Because you could have done a experiment row, right? This is just the orders. Were. Right, so if with a experiment row, you can you know, give a sense for oh. the, the effect size of the, the ordinal correlation. Yeah. So I wonder what, what that was. Uh, I have a so, so what exactly then, because I mean, when you say you got 23 out of the 28, <coughs> do you mean that 23 of them were perfect when the order was perfectly preserved for 23? Yeah, is so, so, so rank orders. So you it's just rank orders. I understand orders. that, but you mean that it's, it's like, so you essentially, where were the, the five that didn't fit? It's what I'm asking you. When I know where the lack, where oh. the lack of fit took place. Uh, yeah, let's see. Likewise for the 53 of the 60. Well, I don't have that. Uh, okay. So these two are wrong. This one's wrong. And that one's wrong. Any idea as to why there were, there were those violations? Um, it's, there are too few wrong ones to make the story. Okay. Got it. Uh, we initially thought, oh, maybe glide is weakly represented, and maybe that's why we're not quite getting. Maybe there's a human failure with glide symmetry, but I would, I wouldn't.
go there. Yeah, I wonder about the, the, the argument that B3 may be, you know, that you have a way to account for its function here. I mean, this, is, this is all of a, a bunch of electrodes at the back of the That's right, I understand, but I'm talking about something else, the B3 uh, uh, characterization you made earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so B3 is interesting, I, I agree, I've read about you know, the fact that it's hard to determine what it's for, but could it be, do you know whether it has been linked with local versus global processing? You know, the idea of uh, processing local versus global features. Because you know, there's something yeah. here that is related to that, right? This idea of this tightly, you know, this, the tiger patterns, right? The, the texture patterns versus the, you know, the more sparse patterns. Uh, yeah. I wonder yeah. If, if that has something to do more with global versus local uh, processing of features. Well, receptive fields definitely get bigger. So there's, but, and they get bigger, even bigger in V4. So that helps you sort of see more of the pattern so that you could pick up, oh, I, I got it. Uh, I've got a full motif in my receptive field, and that's better than having a little piece of it. So that may explain at least part of why you need to go at least to V3 before you can do anything that's, like you say, quasi-global. But global usually implies some notion of very complex, Reentrant processing, and this looks like the early stage of its feed forward. Uh, so you can get a lot of that higher order statistical structure out of 150 milliseconds. Boom, you got it. Um, One yeah. Thank you very much.